Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You can be seated. All right, your next witness. Your Honor, we'd like to call Laura Amber Heard to the stand. All right. Amber, Amber Laura. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You can be seated. All right, your next witness. Your Honor, we'd like to call Laura Amber Heard to the stand. All right. Amber, Amber Laura. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Your Honor. Will you please state your name? Yes, it's Amber Laura Heard. And what is your address? I live in Yucca Valley, California. And how old are you, Amber? I am 36. I just celebrated. Okay. And do you have a daughter? I do. Uh, she also celebrated her birthday recently. She's one. Okay. And what is your profession? I am an actor, uh, mostly. Okay. Now, why are you here? I am here because my ex-husband is suing me uh, for an op-ed I wrote. And how do you feel about that? I, um, I st struggle to have the words. I struggle to find the words to describe how uh, painful this is. Um, this is horrible for me to sit here uh, for weeks and um, relive everything, um, hear people that I knew, um, some well, some not, my ex-husband with whom I shared a life. Um, speak um, about our lives in the way that they have. Um, this has been one of, the, this is the most painful and difficult thing I've ever gone through, for sure. Now, there was a trial in the UK in July of 2020 where Mr. Depp had sued the Sun newspaper and Dan Wooten. Do you recall that? Yes. Uh, and what was your level of participation in that lawsuit, in that trial? Well, I was uh, not party to that lawsuit. I was um, a witness, um, I, I suppose the primary witness, since it dealt with the truth of the relationship um, that I shared with Johnny. And what, if any, role did you have to play with respect to, for example, witness statements and testifying? Objection, compound. I said, for example. Uh, overruled. I had to write, um, I think I gave seven witness statements um, under oath testimony. I sat on the stand um, for four days um, under mostly cross-examination. And up until this point, it was the hardest thing I had ever had to do. Thank you, Amber. <clears throat> I'm gonna take you back, and if you can just tell the jury a little bit about your background. Tell us where you grew up. I come from Austin, Texas, a small town outside of Austin that you probably haven't heard of. No one has. Um, it's called Maynard. And uh, I was raised by my mother and my father. And I grew up with a little sister, although I have a big sister as well. 
And your little sister's name is? Uh, her name is Whit. Whit Hurd. And how, how much of an age difference is there between the two of you? Whitney and I are about one year, I think we're 16 months apart, so right next to each other. And what did your father do for a living? Uh, my father um, broke horses and did construction, had, um, he painted houses, um, and uh, hunted and fished, but that was for fun. And what did your mom do? She worked for the state of Texas. Um, let me just, since you talked about the breaking horses, can you just tell the jury what your role is in assisting your dad on that and what is involved in breaking horses? Objection leading. Can you just tell me about? Overruled. Um, you just got to stay on, basically. Uh, I, I would help him. I was more of a, a crash test dummy. You know, when you train a horse, you... It, it's a wild animal. It doesn't necessarily like to be um, ridden. And uh, there are people out there um, who are crazy enough, like my dad, to pick that as a profession, I guess. And he was really good with horses, and um, I was the son he never had. So it was my job to, you know, stay on. And what, if anything, did you learn from your father about how to react to the horses? Well, with training horses, um, I guess the key the the key things are to not show fear, not get intimidated, not show fear, be tough and calm. Tell the jury a little bit about your educational background during those growing up years and your work experience. Uh, I, I worked uh, any job that I could from the time I was really young. I wanted to get out of Texas and do something with my life and see things and do things. Um, so I was in school and really pushed myself to, I, I just always pushed myself to um, be able to accelerate the process. I wanted to, you know, get out of school as fast as I could and I wanted to do I wanted to do more things with my life than stay in Texas. So what types of things, so where did you go to school when you were um, younger? I was a scholarship kid at a Catholic school um, growing up, uh, several different Catholic schools, but they were always in the other, you know, on the other side of town, in the wealthier part of town, and um, I grew up quite um, working class, and uh, and, and thankfully with, um, you know, as long as I maintained an A average, I, uh, I, I enjoyed the benefit of a scholarship. And I did that until I realized that I could take my GED and SATs early. And I did that and placed out of school and effectively left school uh, at 16 years old, I believe. And what did you do for work during those younger years? Growing up. Uh, several different Catholic schools, but they were always in the other, you know, on the other side of town, in the wealthier part of town. And um, I grew up quite um, working class, and uh, and and thankfully, with um, you know, as long as I maintained an A average, I, uh, I I enjoyed the benefit of a scholarship and. I did that until I realized that I could take my GED and SATs early, and I did that and placed out of school and effectively left school uh, at 16 years old, I believe. And what did you do for work during those younger years? I took any job that I could. I worked at my father's construction company, sometimes, um, you know, just administrative stuff. I mean, it was a small company. Um, but I answered phones, and I uh, worked at a, like a modeling agency that was also, you know, um, offered photography classes, makeup classes, hair, hair and makeup classes for people that were pursuing a career in entertainment. And I uh, started taking um, classes that I paid for by working there, effectively as a trade. 
uh, and I eventually worked there long enough to be able to pay for my headshots, which are the pictures that you use in the industry to promote yourself, you know, in in whatever acting, modeling, or both. Okay. And <clears throat> what, if any, charitable work did you do when you were still young? It started off as a, a requirement for the school I went to, and then I liked it so much, I think, because it, it meant I wasn't at home, and that was important to me, is just to not spend time at home. Uh, and I, um, I really, I really loved meeting people. So I worked at the soup kitchen every morning before school, um, during the school year, uh, for about four years. There were I didn't go on weekends, um, but on weekends I would do um, various things. Worked at children's um, like at children's uh, museums typically because they would work with younger volunteers. Um, and mostly soup kitchens and things involving children. I worked at the um, with deaf kids for a while, and uh, yeah, I I love it. And when you worked with deaf kids, what if anything did you do to learn to be able to work with them? Objection leading and four hundred four. And relevance, Your Honor. Oh. Overruled. Um, well, I I taught myself how to sign basic sign language, and then I um, I pursued it. I audited a, uh, a translate um, a course at the community college, which I ended up going to um, to get out of high school early um, later on, but I would audit classes. The teachers never wanted to kick the, you know, random 12-year-old out of their class, I suppose. So I remarkably was able to audit, uh, um, I think, the majority of two semesters, and that's also help, help me learn. <laughs> so how did you end up in Los Angeles? I use, I met, I did a, I did a small job in Texas uh, where I played a part in a movie and the actor in the movie that I was playing opposite had an agent visiting him from LA and I met her on set and she said that she had heard about me from another bit part I did. You know, I was taking jobs in Austin for really anything, to be an extra, to apply my, I did makeup once. I, um, you know, nothing, no job was too small or, you know, for me. So I, I put myself out there and she had heard about me and she said, I have heard about you in this town and I'd love to meet you in LA if you're ever out in LA and I was like um, oh, when can I come uh, and she made an appointment with me for the following week and I used all but hundred and eighty dollars or something um, to get out there and that's I landed I didn't know anyone uh, I was 17 um, and I, I've effectively ever been there ever since I suppose so when you arrived in Hollywood, please tell the jury what you did to get moving there, get going. I uh, went to every audition, every casting, every meeting, every appointment that I could. I, I put myself out there. I didn't have a car um, because those were expensive. Um, so I took the bus around LA. It was before smartphones. I had a, a Thomas guide in my bag and a change of tank tops. Um, not that it mattered, but I went to about 10 auditions sometimes a day and would change clothes if I needed to in the back of you know the bus I was taking and I just hustled from one audition to the other. And uh, I got a bit part on one thing and then I got a bit part on another thing and then eventually my roles kind of became more important or bigger and um, it's been a slow progression, I guess, since then, you know, of doing either tiny bit parts in bigger movies or doing, you know, larger roles in movies that no one would see. And I guess, you know, it still is kind of like that. So I'm going to ask you to go from 2002 to 2009. If you could just describe for the jury a little bit what types of parts you had, um, I think, They've indicated they didn't. You you have not been well known here uh, in this courtroom compared to Mr. Depp. So perhaps just take them through a little bit of that. 
Yeah, that's fair. Um, I did small roles in big films like you know, Zombie Land and um, Pineapple Express and uh, movies that were well known. Um, my first one was Friday Night Lights. Uh, but again, I had small roles in those bigger films. And then I would do larger roles in um, kind of s smaller films. Like I brought, um, I did a project where I was the lead in a John Carpenter film and he came out of retirement to do that. And that's kind of the, how it was in terms of my career for those initial, that, that first initial 10 years or so. It was just going from slightly bigger role to slightly bigger role and just working my butt off. So I'm going to take you up to 2008. Did there come a time that you auditioned for The Rum Diary? Yes, I, um, I auditioned for that in about 2008, I believe. Please describe for the jury your experience in auditioning for The Rum Diary. Well, I auditioned a few times, which is common in my wanted to meet me in person. Um, I thought I would be going for maybe an audition, um, but it was just a meeting. I went to his office um, and, and met with him for a few hours. And what did you talk about during that, those few hours? We talked about books and music, poetry. Um, we like a lot of the same, we liked a lot of the same stuff, you know, obscure writers and, you know, interesting books and pieces of poetry that I haven't heard anybody else reference or know or like. And he um, was very well read and charismatic. And, sh you know, I think I left the office with a few books that he gave me. And we spent the whole time just talking about things that we care about. And I was, I was so surprised that somebody, you know, I knew who he was. I wasn't familiar, you know, I wasn't a fan of his work, I wasn't familiar with him, but I knew who he was, you know, he's mo one of the most famous people in the world. So it was al already a weird thing to go and get called into his office and, you know, I'm a no-name actor, I was 22, I think, and I thought it was unusual. <laughs> it was weird because he's, he was twice my age and he's this world-famous actor and here we are getting along about obscure books and weird, you know, old blues. And we just, it, it was, I thought it was remarkable. You know, I just hadn't really, I thought it was unusual and remarkable. I left there just feeling like, wow. So did there come a time that you learned that you were going to be cast for the role in The Rum Diary? Yes, a few days later, my agent um, said that, Johnny's going to call you. We gave him your phone number. And I was like, oh, okay. And shortly after, I my phone rings. I pick it up, and I hear, you know, this, like, deep voice on the other line. And he said, you got the, you know, you, you're it, kid. You're the, you're the dream. Hunter wrote this part, and you're the dream. You're it, kid. I was like, and my Please describe for the jury what that means. What what was the, the Rome Diary and this Hunter Thompson? What what was the concept here, and what role were you playing? Um, well, it was my understanding that he was bringing to life a, his late friend, and what he told me was that this character is supposed to be the dream woman, like the dream American dream, and. Um, so I knew what he meant. He indicated to me when he told me I got the role that I was I was that you know that he I was the dream kid. That's what he said. So did there come a time that you started filming the Rum Diary? Yes, I'm not quite sure how much. I think we started filming in maybe March of 2009. And where did you film the Rum Diary? We shot it in Puerto Rico. Um, and describe, if you can, the events of the filming and your interactions with Mr. Depp during that time. It was a bit surreal, you know, uh, filming in a place like Puerto Rico. It was beautiful. Um, it takes place in the 50s, so everything 
really looked beautiful, the, you know, cars and clothing, the music, it was just, it was a very colorful um, shoot in general. I, I, I couldn't have asked for, you know, a, a, a better scenario. I, I, I was on, on film, I mean, I was on set um, reading my books and every, occasionally Johnny would talk to me and then he started to be really kind to me, uh, m like more open with me. Uh, when we'd have hot days filming, it, you know, there'd be this big SUV pull up and a security guard would kind of usher me into this car and it would have the AC blasting and I'd be <laughs> sitting in the back of the SUV just thinking what a strange experience the whole thing was. And, you know, we didn't really have a whole lot of interaction on set until, um, until we did a scene that involved um, kissing. We, we had a kissing scene and it didn't feel like a normal, it didn't feel like a normal scene anymore. It felt, um, it felt more real. There are certain things that you do in the job to um, be professional, like when you have to do that sort of scene and you don't like, you, <laughs> You don't use your tongue if you can't, if you can avoid it. There's certain things that you do to just maintain a certain line, and it just felt like those lines were blurred. I mean, he grabbed my face and pulled me into him and really kissed me. Did, but we were filming a scene. Did he use his tongue? Yes. Okay. Did your birthday, did you celebrate your birthday while you were in Puerto Rico? I did. I celebrated maybe my 23rd birthday there. And what, if anything, did Mr. Depp do for your birthday? Well, we were already kind of talking about books and poetry and things like that. He gave me a few really beautiful poetry books. And uh, he gave me a bicycle, uh, like a vintage bicycle, because at the time I was riding around in, on a bike and in, I had a lot of time off since I was a smaller role in the movie. And... Um, yeah, I think that was it. Okay. Now, did there come a time that um, you ended up visiting him in his trailer? Yes. Um, I think there was a, we would hang out if, you know, after or in between scenes or in between setups, we often were, you know, talking about things and would continue the conversation into the trailer, um, often with the director, Bruce Robinson was his name. Um, and then at one point, we, we talk about wine. It's another thing that Johnny and I shared in common, a love for uh, wine, red wine. Uh, and we were talking about um, a kind of wine that I enjoyed, and I was you know, going on about how great this bargain wine was. And I didn't understand you know, how much more sophisticated Johnny's taste in wine was. Um, so I was going on about the virtues of Malbec or something, and I brought him a bottle of this wine and I set it down and at some point I'm, I'm, I'm going back to get back to set and he kind of kicked his like, you know, foot up in the air and basically kind of lifted the back of my bathrobe up and... Can I just stop you there? Why were you wearing a bathrobe? Because I was doing a scene, um, it was a period film so it uh, took place in the 50s. And so I had all of this um, old undergarments that are for that time era um, on. And the scene involved me changing. Um, so I had all the, the costume on. And he kind of picked up the back of my robe with his boot. And I kind of turned around and like laughed, like giggled, you know. Um, it, I wasn't, I didn't feel I just didn't, like, I didn't know what to make of it at the time, and it just kind of, I just kind of giggled and batted it away playfully, and uh, he, he kind of playfully kind of pushed me down on this, like, bed sofa uh, that was in his trailer, just playful um, and flirtatious, and he said, uh, yum, and he kind of, like, lifted up his eyebrows like that, and I... 
just giggled, l laughed it off, kind of batted him away, and, you know, moved on, went back to set. And were you in a relationship at that time? I was. Okay. And was Mr. Depp in a relationship at that time? That was my understanding, yeah. Uh, and did anything else of significant happen during that, that time period while you were filming with Mr. Depp, other than what you've told us? We just had this... You know, it, it was a friendship, a flirtatious thing. We, I felt chemistry. I felt this other thing that was that went beyond the pale of my job, for sure. Uh, Johnny clearly felt that way about me. Had indicated to me that that's how he felt in many different ways, and but at the same time, that's. You know, we were both in relationships, and it is a job, and, you know, I, it was intimidating, and I, I just remember feeling kind of intimidated and a little nervous about that, and I also was in a relationship, so we went our separate ways, and we didn't hear, I didn't hear from him for a long time. And, and that's, so approximately how long were you filming in Puerto Rico for the Rome Diary? A few months is my best All guess. right, and when you left Puerto Rico in the filming, when is the next time that you had any contact from Mr. Depp? And contact could include a anything, uh, uh, communications, written communications, uh, as well as uh, telephone or otherwise. Uh, we had no contact until uh, Johnny called me on the phone one day, and I was driving, and he invited me over to his home in, in California, in Beverly Hills. And I, um, I was out of the blue. I didn't even have his phone number. Um, so I was, it was quite unexpected. Uh, he called me a second time, but I, I don't think we actually connected or we didn't stay on the phone um, because we didn't, well, yeah, we didn't really speak. But the first time was the only time I actually spoke to him. And he invited me over to his house uh, under kind of the, he said that, you know, we could get Bruce, who was the director, uh, to come over, something about the movie, but it was clearly not about the movie, if you know what I mean. It was, so I said, um, I, I said my friends are in town, uh, and I'm, I'm I'm busy with that, and kind of hung up, feeling really startled. But you know, that didn't know what else to do. What if any gifts did Mr. Depp send you during that time period after you filmed the Rum Diary? Uh, he sent me several gifts. He sent me a beautiful dress, uh, one that I wore in the movie, uh, with a beautiful handwritten note that said, happy wrapping, and um, made a reference to the dress being wrapping paper. Uh, he sent me a few gorgeous, expensive, what I can only assume are expensive, um, collectible books, uh, items. Uh, and then when I was away filming on a different, you know, a different job, he uh, attempted, or he did send me um, some guitars. Uh, I know one delivery, I was informed about one delivery, um, and I, my partner at the time uh, intercepted the, the, the attempt to, to deliver and called me immediately and said, what should I do? And I said, well, send, I said, send it back. And she did, and she indicated that there was, at the time, that there was another one that had already previously attempted delivery, and it was also rejected. We sent it, I sent it back, because I wasn't there, and I wouldn't have accepted it anyway. Okay. Did there come a time that you ended up having to go on a press tour for the Rum Diary? We, I got a call for the Rum Diary press tour in the fall of 2011. So that's close to two, two and a half years after you filmed? Um, I'm an actress, not a mathematician <laughs> for a reason. They, they, roughly, yes. Okay. And um, could you please describe for the jury what a press tour is? Just explain it to them. Well, you take a, a movie once it's completed, and uh, if it doesn't have distribution, you, as part of the promotion of that movie, you go to these various... Places, normally cities um, like London or New York, and you 
do press events in those cities to kind of promote the film. And you go to place to place talking about the film. And so you were then called to participate in the press tour for the Rome Diary? Uh, yes, I had um, just, I was going, I had just finished going through the process of a separation with my former partner and I was moving and going through that and I got a phone call saying, remember that movie you did in Puerto Rico? Well, they want you for the press tour and I said, well, perfect timing. Uh, <laughs> and we did that, I think, October, late October, 2011. So describe for the jury your interactions with Mr. Depp during the press tour. Well, on the first stop of the, well, first stop, the beginning of the tour was Los Angeles, where we both li lived, and we did a press day, normal press day, and then at the end of it, uh, I was invited uh, by Johnny to come up to his room to have a drink with, uh, him and the director uh, of the film. And I went up to the room um, to see both him and Bruce, um, but as soon as I got there, Johnny said Bruce wasn't going to make it. So I stayed. Johnny and I started talking. Uh, I told, He asked me about my relationship. I said, well, you know, I'm going, I'm going through it. Um, I'm going through the separation right now, and it's been... You know, rough couple of months, but that's normal. And he said, "Well, that same with, same with me. You know, it's been. I, I can't remember exactly how long he said it had been, but that he had split from the mother of his kids and uh, said that he understood." All right. And then what happened next? Uh, then we drank red wine and continued to talk, and the talking became us. You know. Reconnect, you know, it was like reconnection was almost instant. Um, it was just chemistry. It's hard to explain that, but we sat on the couch and we talked, and um, you know, it, it felt like there was uh, it, it felt like there was an electricity to the room, and it's how I felt when I was alone with him anyway, and it was instant again. I was like, whoa. So uh, on the on the couch, we we talked finished some wine, and then I got up and left. And as I went to leave, uh, he grabbed both sides of my face, uh, similar to what he did in, in, in Puerto Rico when we were filming that, that scene. And he kissed me, and I kissed him back. 